The date is March 1943, and in a prisoner of war camp inside occupied Poland, Royal Canadian Air Force pilot William Ash approaches the camp's toilet facilities. A single POW leans against the latrine's doorways, casually keeping watch on the rest of the camp. The POW nods at Ash as he approaches and allows him to enter the small, squat latrine. Inside are two rows of toilets built in the classic Roman style. Nine boxed-in seats ring the sides of the room and consist of nothing more than concrete boxes with no dividers between them. The wooden seats led down to a large concrete pit underneath where hundreds of prisoners relieve themselves into every day. A small hole leads to a huge sewage pit, which is drained every week into the waiting truck of a local farmer who uses the camp's waste to fertilize his fields. As Ash enters the building, he spots two men seated at the far seats, who return his nod of greeting. One of them stands and lifts the seat he was just sitting on, revealing a hole in the concrete that's just barely large enough for a man to squeeze through. The stench of human waste wafts up from below, powerful enough to make the men's eyes tear up as they fight the urge to vomit. Yet, powering through the horrid assault on their nostrils, the men climb down into the hole one by one. As they land, a few inches of wastewater splash urine and feces all over the men, but they ignore it as they turn their attention to the task at hand. The men remove a panel that's been made to look like a false wall and reveal a small chamber beyond, which has been carved from the frozen soil itself. Using candles made of boot strings and margarine held in a tin dish, the men join three others who are already waiting there and strip down to their underwear. One man sits at a bellows made of old leather kit bags, and as he works it he pushes air through a pipe made of old cans into the tunnel which the crew has been digging for weeks now. Two men now move down into that tunnel while the remainder stay behind to handle the soil that the diggers displace in their dig. The entire crew is split up into shifts, with some men taking turns digging while others man the bellows, dispose of the dirt, or stands watch above. Disposal of the dirt is accomplished by pushing the dirt through the sump directly onto the toilets above and into the huge sewage pit beyond. Once a week, Polish farmer Franciszek Lewandowski arrives at the camp and pumps the sewage out for use on his farm. Yet Lewandowski has begun to notice more and more dirt in the wastewater. Before he has a chance to complain to the Nazi guards, though, another prisoner, Josef Birks, a young Czechoslovakian, informs Lewandowski of the escape plan. The Polish farmer is no fan of the Nazis, especially after their invasion and occupation of his home, and keeps the plan a secret, doing his part to aid the would-be escapees by dutifully carting away the soil. As the digging team finishes its work for the day, the third team enters the tunnel and begins the job of shoring up the tunnel walls and ceiling. The tunneling work, carried out with nothing more than cut out aluminum cans, is dangerous work, and the tunnel is under constant threat of collapse. Each day that the tunnel extends further and deeper, the men require just a little bit more courage to enter the dark tunnel, not knowing if that's the day the tunnel will collapse and trap them with little or no hope of rescue. It's the job of the third team then to enter and shore up the sides and ceiling as best they can, using wooden boards taken from their barracks and even the bed frames themselves. The boards make for a rudimentary shoring but help add a little bit of safety to the entire endeavor. As they shore up the freshly dug length of tunnel, the men also extend the air pipe which brings in oxygen to the tunneling crew. They use powdered milk cans for the job, cutting them so that they fit end to end. The air they pump is from the latrine itself and fed it with the stench of human waste, but it brings life-saving oxygen as the men dig deeper and further into the earth. To expedite the process of digging, the men have developed an ingenious system to move freshly dug earth to the latrine sump for disposal. Two lengths of rope extend down the tunnel, and at one end is an empty sack. The diggers fill the sack with dirt and then give the rope a sharp tug, which causes the man at the halfway point to begin hauling on the rope to bring the dirt out of the tunnel. Once it reaches the midway point, that man attaches it to the second rope, whose end he has with him, and then gives that rope a sharp tug. The men at the entrance then drag the sack from the halfway point all the way to the entrance of the tunnel, where the dirt is emptied into the latrine sump. The system is rudimentary and nowhere as near sophisticated as the homemade railroad tracks and trolleys that the men at the Stalag Luft III prison complex would use to escape and serve as inspiration for the film The Great Escape. Yet the process saves countless hours of labor, as it takes half an hour to squeeze down the two foot by two foot tunnel each day. In early March of 1943, the team digging at the end of the tunnel began to dig directly upwards. By their calculations, they've dug several hundred feet past the perimeter fencing, a task which required them to not just dig out from their starting point, 
but down into the rocky soil to a depth of over a dozen feet in order to avoid the seismic sensors that the Germans have installed to detect digging. Once well out of the fence, the tunnel begins to angle upwards again and now the men are digging straight up. One of them takes a long stick and pushes it into the ceiling above, feeling resistance for two feet before the stick gives way to the top side. The tunnel is finished, and to avoid detection, the last two feet of the tunnel will be dug up on the day of their escape. Now the men prepare for their breakout. While the dig teams were working for weeks on the tunnel, Birsk, the young Czech, has been helping secure fake papers for the escapees. To do this, he managed to talk his way into being part of a detail that's taken every week under guard to a produce store in town. There, the prisoner detail buys a few luxuries for the POWs, such as chocolate, cigarettes, and the sorts. They pay for this from the meager wages paid to them by the German government under its obligations to pay POWs for their labor via the Geneva Convention. At the store, a young Polish girl, Stefania Malutzenska, works behind the counter, and it isn't long before she's swooning at Birk's charms. She's been helping to smuggle letters to Birk's family members for months, but now the escapees need her help in far more dangerous work. Stefania has friends who work at Town Hall, and she has them steal official German forms that will serve as a template for the forged identity papers needed by the escapees. Their identity papers will ID the escapees as Polish citizens after their escape, allowing them to bypass security checkpoints and hide their identities as POWs. Yet, for the papers to look legitimate, there's one more thing that's needed a photograph of each of the escapees to adorn their fake papers. To get these photographs, Stefania takes the biggest risk of her life and helps secure a small camera and film from a Polish laborer who used to be a teacher before the German invasion. Now he's forced to do hard labor and work rebuilding the same roads the Germans themselves bombed in the invasion. And helping the prisoners escape will be his small measure of revenge against the Nazis. The camera and the film is smuggled into camp via a 17-year-old boy who routinely brings a shipment of the prisoners' daily allowance of bread, all hidden safely amongst the loaves. After the prisoners take their photos, the film is then smuggled out through the same young teenage boy who develops the photos himself in a makeshift photo lab inside his parents' tiny apartment. All of these brave Polish civilians assisting the escapees are taking huge risks, and discovery of their involvement would certainly lead to a quick execution. The date for the breakout is set to be March 5th, as those amongst the prisoners with meteorological knowledge estimate that this will be the next moonless night. In order to have the best chance of escape, the men must move under the cover of deepest darkness, and with no moon in the sky, they stand a good chance of being unseen by the perimeter sentries. The men decide that immediately after 5 p.m. roll call, a group of them will head straight to the tunnel and wall themselves in until after lockup at 9 p.m., when the rest of the group will sneak out of their bunks and make their way to the tunnel. A mathematician amongst them calculates that the tunnel will be able to support up to 33 men for 6 hours before the oxygen runs out and the men asphyxiate. The figures and the math are both rough, but it's the best the men have to go on. At 5 p.m. on March 5th, the guards line up the POWs and conduct their daily count. Satisfied that all men are accounted for, they're left alone for recreation time. 800 men move to the recreation ground where a rugby match has been staged in order to help cover the escape attempt. The men plotting their escape conceal clean clothes under their coats, their pockets stuffed with a concoction termed the mixture, a high-energy food made by the prisoners. In each of their pockets are also their identification papers, a map of the region, and a homemade compass. Overhead, gray clouds build up and cold gusts of wind force the German guards to seek what shelter they can inside their guard towers. The men head to the latrine in pairs, and once inside, ditch their overcoats and make their way into the filth below. As the night goes on, the men are relieved to discover that the calculations for oxygen supply were correct, and at last 9 p.m. rolls around along with the final group to enter the escape tunnel. The men break through the last two feet of dirt at the end of the tunnel and crawl out into freedom grateful to leave the smelly, stinking tunnel behind at last. The men break up into groups and head in different directions so as not to draw attention to themselves, posing as travelers. Unfortunately, within the end of the week, all 36 escapees would be recaptured by the Germans, with many sent off to new prison camps. Though the escape ultimately failed, it proved to be one of the most daring and smelliest escapes of World War II, inspiring many heroic attempts by other Allied soldiers throughout the rest of the conflict. Think you could have stomached digging through a giant sewer to get to safety? Let us know in the comments, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.